Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Sean Reardon. I'm a professor at Stanford University. But before I taught at Stanford, I taught high school for four years. I taught for two years on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. Now, Pine Ridge sits in the poorest county in the United States. And following that, I taught for two more years in Morristown, New Jersey, which is an affluent suburban community outside of Philadelphia. And as a young teacher, I was struck by the vast inequality in the schools, in the community resources, and the opportunities that young people had in these two really different parts of America. And I've spent a lot of time since then thinking about what I as a teacher and what we as a society can do to address these big inequalities in educational opportunity. And I'm not alone in thinking about this. If you listen to policy debates about inequality these days, you hear a lot of discussion about educational inequality and opportunity and what to do about it. And if you listen to those debates, you'll hear sort of two arguments about what to do. One argument says the fault is in our schools, and therefore the remedy must be in our schools. If we only provided high-quality schools in every community in America, we'd have equal opportunity. The other argument says that Poverty and inequality are powerful forces that shape inequality in America, too powerful for schools alone to address. If we're going to create equal opportunity, we need to address it in a larger way than just through the school system. So which is right? Can we build equal opportunity just through the school system, or do we need to address it more broadly? Well, one way to sort of get an answer to this is to look at some data. So, if we look at Pine Ridge and Morristown, the, the two places where I taught, this graph shows you the, on the horizontal axis is the, the level of poverty or affluence of a community, a sort of measure of socioeconomic status. To the left is poorer communities, to the right is richer communities. And the vertical axis shows you a measure of average academic achievement in a community. Pine Ridge, where I taught first, far to the left and far to the bottom of the graph. Socioeconomic status is three standard deviations lower than the national average, and test scores are three grade levels but below the national average. It's a poor place with very low levels of academic performance. Morristown, on the other hand, is very affluent and very high performing. Now, I'm not going to ask you to make public policy based on the two schools where I happen to teach. Uh, <laughs> And as fascinating as my life is, we probably shouldn't you know, use it as the source of social science evidence about inequality. So instead of just looking at the two places where I taught, let's look at every school district in America. Now, whatever you think of No Child Left Behind, one thing it did is it left us a legacy of an enormous amount of achievement data, test score data from every single school in the United States. In fact, Elementary and middle school students in America took a quarter of a billion standardized tests over the last five years. 250 million tests. Now, whatever you think of tests, and there's a lot of reason to think they're a very incomplete proxy for the success of our educational system, they're still a, a relatively useful proxy for a kind of a crude measure of how well our educational system is doing. I like to think of this as sort of the, uh, like the Woody Allen joke about the restaurant where you know, the food was terrible, but at least the portions were large. <laughs> and, in, and in this case, the portions are really, really quite large. So, so let's look at the 250 million test scores in the United States. So every dot on this picture is a school district in the United States. There's about 12,000 school districts represented on this picture. And you can see a very clear pattern here. School districts with low levels of socioeconomic status have relatively low levels of academic achievement. School systems with high levels of socioeconomic status have high levels of academic achievement. The correlation here, for those of you who like these kind of things, is 0.85. That's a very high correlation. Another way to look at it is to say, are there any low-income school districts in America where kids are performing near or at the national average? And the answer is no. That is. If you think of school districts as sort of laboratories of education, laboratories of innovation and in education, places where each, each school district, each school can try out different ways to try to 
create equal opportunity for children. Have we been successful? Somewhere should have been successful out of these thousands of school districts if it were possible to do so in the context of high levels of poverty. But nowhere has. That suggests that it's probably not possible to produce equal opportunity solely through the educational system alone. We're going to have to, we're going to, have to address larger inequalities in American society. If we just looked at, the, say, the 100 largest school districts in the United States, you would see this similar pattern. The poorest of those on the far left are Cleveland and Detroit, very poor cities with very low academic achievement. And the more affluent large districts are doing better. But one thing I think you should notice about this is that it's not strictly true that socioeconomic conditions are destiny within a school district. That is, there are school districts serving relatively similar populations of students, but doing more or less well by them. For example, Boston and San Bernardino, California, two school districts that both serve relatively disadvantaged populations of students, very similar populations of students, but students in Boston score a grade and a half to two grade levels higher on average than those do in San Bernardino. A similar pattern in Seminole County and Prince George's County, Maryland, equal socioeconomic status, but about two grade levels difference. That suggests that there is the possibility for school districts to innovate in ways that are likely to be more successful for their students. What is Boston doing that makes it more successful than San, Bernard San Bernardino? Well, we know Boston has a very expensive and high quality uh, public preschool program that was implemented. We know it has high, uh, a very uh, high quality teaching force. So there may be things that Boston has been able to do that we can learn from that will help us understand how to improve education in places like San Bernardino, for example. But another way to think about it is maybe it's not just Boston and San Bernardino that are different. Boston is in Massachusetts, San Bernardino is in California. If we looked at every school district in Massachusetts, those are the white dots, and every school district in California, those are the red dots, you see a striking pattern here. The white dots are almost uniformly above that line. That is, they're almost uniformly above average for their socioeconomic status, whereas the red dots, particularly in the low and middle, com middle income parts of the graph, are uniformly below the line. That is, California school districts are underperforming relative to other school districts around the country like them, and Massachusetts school districts are generally overperforming relative to school districts around the country. So that suggests it's not just something at the school district level. It's not just something that administrators are doing in Boston, but something about the state context, about state policy, state funding for schools, and the larger context of the state that makes uh, opportunity easier for students. Now, with 250 million data points, I could tell you a lot more about what places are doing well, where test scores are going up. I'm not going to go into all the detail right now. But, but I want you to, to think about all the things we could learn from this. When I was teaching in Pine Ridge and Morristown, I didn't know how to solve the problems of educational inequality. But today we have the data that I think can help us get there. And the data clearly show, on the one hand, that there are school districts serving poor students that are doing much better than others. We, can, we need to identify those places, and we need to learn from those places. But that's not going to be enough. If we truly want to create educational, equal educational opportunity in America, we're going to have to address the larger structural problems of economic inequality and economic segregation that, that divide communities across the country. Thank you.